Hi, ladies, um, and any gentlemen that may be watching this too. Uh, this is our session two. There's something about Mary, and we're going to be looking at Mary of Bethany. Um, before I get into it, I just want to be sure to pray. So, dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you. You're so good, and we just pray that you would um, bless the people viewing this and watching this and just reveal something new from your word to their heart, Lord God. Um, just be with us and guide us through this teaching today. In your name we pray. Amen. So, anyways, so let's get back into it. So, last week, our last session, I talked briefly about that 400 years of silence period um, and that intertestamental period. And I just want to get into it a little bit more of what happened because it really affected women. And women, you know, had such an amazing role in the Old Testament. You know, we see so many great just leaders in women. Um, you see Deborah as a judge. You see uh, Queen Esther and Ruth and just these amazing women. And then you kind of open up the New Testament and it's a different vibe going on with women. And it's kind of like, what, what happened? They just don't seem to have the same honor as they did uh, before. But as I came to say, uh, Jesus came on the scene not to turn things right um, upside down, but to turn them right side up. And he's going to do that even with women. So a prominent person in the Jewish um, culture during that intertestamental period was Ben Sira. And his quotes and his teachings were taught at the synagogue. And a lot of them had to do with women. Let me read you some of those quotes. It says, Women are responsible for sin coming into the world. Their spite is unbearable. The, and um, so that changes every fight you're going to ever have with your husband. <laughs> it's like, can you please take out the trash? No, sorry, honey. You brought sin into the world. <laughs> Another quote is, A man's spite is preferable to a woman's kindness. Women give rise to shame and reproach. They aren't hearing this around town. They're hearing this in the synagogue where God's holy word is being taught. And women just had no worth outside of the relationship with a man. Some more quotes. If you don't like your wife, don't trust her. Be careful to keep record of all the supplies you issue to her. Deed no property to her. To Ben Sira, women are just a total loss. Um, as Christy McClellan kind of reiterates in her study, Jesus and women in the first century and now. But Jesus is coming on the scene and his ministry is going to be vastly different in two major ways. One of them is his table presence. He's going to eat with sinners. He's not going to be afraid of that. And another one we see is just his interactions with women. They are mighty and they are powerful and they're very encouraging. So, Israel, ancient Israel in the first century, they're an honor shame society. And so, you're either honorable up here or you're shameful down here. Women were way below. As you can imagine by all these quotes that were going around and these viewpoints and these teachings that have been taught for 200 years before Jesus and this is what people thought and this is what people felt and Jesus when he comes on the scene he is going to bring two things to women justice and righteousness and we all can agree that women if they're way down here they need justice and they don't just need a little bit the righteous part is a generous Jesus is so generous giving the righteousness. He's going to bring them way up here, restore their honor. And it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So it's really exciting. Isaiah 9 says that the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness. So how exciting. 
Um, I want to share <laughs> in my video a little clip on it's called company is coming and I wanted to show like the first half of it this um, it's somebody cleaning the house and just like going crazy cleaning everything and making sure everything is nice and just to kind of give a, a laugh um, with the ladies because I'm sure everyone knows someone who's a little bit OCD when it comes to cleaning or having guests over you just want everything to be perfect right and the Middle East, it was no different. They are a very hospitable culture. This is important to them. And uh, it was just always something that they did. They would welcome even strangers. You see this in Abraham's story. He's welcoming strangers. <laughs> and, and it's just important how they, how they treat them. Everyone um, would want to be a good host. It's just very important. And so now we're gonna. I said say all this to kind of set the stage for a story, and uh, we're gonna get into Luke ten thirty eight through forty two, and it's the story you're all probably very familiar with if you've read the Bible. Is a Martha and Mary. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So here we see Martha. She's she's supplying that good Middle Eastern hospitality, and she's welcoming Jesus and obviously all his 12 disciples into her home and preparing the meal. She's probably the oldest because this is her home. Um, we don't know how old she is or how old her sister is. We kind of get the impression that maybe the parents aren't there anymore. It makes no mention of them or mention of her having a husband, anything like that. But here she is. She's welcoming Jesus in, showing that hospitality. And she has a sister. <laughs> Anyone with a sister can relate. I'm sure my sister could relate um, many times how you're busy trying to do stuff and maybe your sister just isn't doing what you want them to do or helping in the way you you want them to uh but anyway she just has this closeness to God that she feels like in her frustration she can go to Jesus and just say hey Lord don't you care you know my sister isn't helping me do something tell her to to help me you know that's bold you don't do that with just anybody you do that with someone who you feel really close with right because you feel like they're gonna probably agree with you and be like yeah Mary go help your your sister but he doesn't do that so um, partly she could be upset that her sister's not helping but also a big thing could be is that her sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus in their culture, rabbis didn't have women disciples. And sitting at the feet is an idiom for a discipleship relationship. And here she is. And this could look embarrassing to the family. She, she might see her sister doing this and just not know how to react or respond or what's, what's going on. Um, but like I say, Jesus is vastly different in his approach with women when he comes on the scene. And whenever Jesus would give parables, rabbis often gave parables. And most of the, of the all the other rabbis, they would just give them in the masculine. Um, something that a man could relate to, a man's working type story. Jesus didn't do that. He provided one in the masculine and one in the feminine. You know, he might be talking about the wine and the wine press, but then the next one is, is a parable on sewing. And, and women could see themselves finally in that, in that 
story and they could relate to these teachings and they felt like it was for them too. Jesus is very inclusive and as we kind of saw a little glimpse of in um, Mary of Nazareth's story when Jesus says whoever obeys my father they are my mother my brother and my sister he is sharing he does have women disciples and there are women in his spiritual family and the eternal family which is just so exciting so Anyways, can you imagine this scene going on <laughs> between siblings, whoever you are? I don't know if you can picture yourself in this story. And where do you see yourself? Is it Martha and you're busy and you're trying to make everything perfect and just right and um, just so? Or is it Mary where you just want to take in the moment and take everything in and sit at Jesus' feet. Or maybe it's a little bit of both or somewhere in between. I think we all can look at this story and imagine ourselves somewhere in it. But I love the Lord's response. He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. He's saying her name twice. Whenever the Lord says your name twice throughout scripture, he's getting ready to change your life. Christy McClellan, I think, said in one of her studies that God will meet you exactly where you're at, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And I love that. He, he's just, Jesus is warm. He's inviting her in. It's not a reprimand or reproach. It's an invitation. And it's like, she's choosing this better choice. And you have the opportunity to do that too. You can sit at my feet too. You can be a disciple too. And it's it's saying that she's anxious and she's she's troubled about many things. So obviously, Martha was distracted with much serving, but there's more than just the casserole in the oven going on here. There's something deeper at heart, and it isn't that serving is the issue, because I think God and Jesus, they love a happy server. If you can serve with a happy heart, people around you will be blessed they will for sure and I don't think that's the thing and I don't think it's to shame Martha I think it's just to look at Mary as an example and just say hey look at her and look what look at what she's doing and if you take the time to do this too you too will have rest and you won't be anxious and worried when things come your way and you've got to serve or do something else important in life you know we all need that quiet time so I have a quote to share with you it's from Helter Skelter a sermon by Levi Lesko and he states that 1,617 on average Americans touch their phones four hours per day a phone usage on average Four hours, average TV consumption, distraction is a full-time job. This leads to anxiety and trouble. A 2004 study found that rates of anxiety people feel can be directly connected to the amount of TV news they consume. When the Boston Marathon happened in 2013, they did a study. And if people watched six hours of coverage, they experienced more PTSD symptoms than the people that were actually there in person, witnessing it firsthand. Our attention span is shrinking, our distraction is increasing, and it's creating anxiety. It takes exactly 23 minutes and 15 seconds before your mind can get back to what you were doing after distraction. Distraction costs us. I just thought that was so enlightening just to hear that just from watching the news, you can experience more anxiety and stress than somebody who was in a tragic incident there in person. Um, and it's just 
I know our world is today and social media and the news coverage and I'm not saying you know go bury your head in the sand I choose not to listen to a lot of news I try to be really mindful um, just about what I take in uh, I don't want to be ignorant either though I think it's just finding that balance and making sure we're getting more of God's Word and his truth than we are what the media is throwing at us because it's going to be him and his word and his truth and knowing his character that's going to give us the peace and the strength to face the day so that we don't have to face it with anxiety and troubles over many things. So this brings me to my first point I want to make is Mary chose what is better. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That is John 14, 1. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. John 14, 27. And Matthew eleven thirty 30 says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that. Yoke for rabbis is an, is an expression that they use for their teachings. It would be their teachings. And Jesus, you know, is just saying, my teachings are going to be light. They're going to give you refreshment for your soul. It's going to be easy if we, if we start the day or the week um, with him, you know, just being in his presence. Distraction is the process of diverting the attention of an individual or group from a desired area of focus and thereby blocking or diminishing the reception of desired information. And that's a definition from Wikipedia. And this brings me to my next point is that Mary had a rhythm of sitting at the Lord's feet listening with undistracted devotion to the Lord. I just love that. I really realize how much I need that discipline and I need it daily. And um, it is an area that, yeah, sometimes I still struggle with just getting it in daily. But I find when I do, my day is better. I have peace. I'm not anxious. I'm usually in a better mood. So I just, I love that about her. Discipline, I think, is just such a great quality, and it, it is something that I'm working on personally, and I would encourage you to do the same if you're feeling that on your heart. Um, a Chinese proverb says, if you don't change the direction, your direction, you will end up exactly where you are going. <laughs> How true is that? If we don't change, we're going to end up where we're going. Where are you going? What is your life like today? Is the person you are today who you want to be in two years, in five years, in ten years? And if it's not, what can you do to start making steps to be that person? Real true disciples in first century Israel they would have been consumed with wanting to be like the rabbi. They would have been consumed wanting to be like Jesus. It was everything to them. And uh, in Galatians 1.12, Paul even says that he received through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He says he went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, he went to Jerusalem before he started his ministry, he made time those three years to just be alone, be with God, and have God fill him. Even Jesus needed that time to be with God to strengthen him. In Matthew fourteen twenty three, it says he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. This is so important that even Jesus finds time to do it. Then how much more important is it for us? So, on to our next portion 
in the Bible, we're going to go to John 11, 1 through 44, and look at the death of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, him whom you love is ill. When Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead in death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he meant he was taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Sorry, that verse kind of cracks me up. Anyways, this is an interesting story. Here the sisters send word to Jesus saying, Lord, the, the one you love is ill. And I, I love it. <laughs> you know, They don't just say, hey, get here so you can save his life, right? They're, they're appealing on Jesus' love, and they have this deep friendship and this amazing relationship with Jesus that they know if they send word to him and say, hey, the one you love is ill, then Jesus is going to want to come, and he's going to want to do something because isn't that how we are as humans? I mean, so many amazing, wonderful friends who I love and I know they love me and I know that if I called them and needed anything like my car breaking down or I was short on rent or whatever it was or just needed prayer I know that I could count on them because of that love and and that's how we tend to kind of see our relationships and um, I just love it but it's interesting because the word love that Martha uses to plead on um, Jesus is actually more of like a friendship kind of love. It's definitely like a human type love, which is just so interesting to me because, excuse me, it says when uh, Jesus res replies and says that he loved them so he stays a couple extra days, that love is a different word. It's agape. It's a godly type love and it's different and I love that because the agape love the godly love it's unconditional it's never ending it's everlasting and it has our best interests at heart and it may not always be what we think right it isn't how we see love but he loves us even better than we could love ourselves. So I think sometimes it's kind of hard to comprehend. But like in the four frames, knowing the character of God, the heart of God, and knowing that he loves us can give us so much comfort when we don't know what he's doing or when he delays like this. <laughs> it doesn't come right away. So God delays they're not denials. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It, I know it feels that way, and I've I felt that way, and I don't know if you felt that way, where you're waiting on God, and there's a dream or something in your heart 
that is good and you're waiting for it to happen and to come to fulfillment and it hasn't happened. And it's so easy to say, God doesn't love me because I'm waiting or I haven't received this or whatever it is. Um, and I know it's tough. I just want to try and encourage you to try and see God in spite of that and try to see his character through little things and just reach out and read your Bible because the more you get to know him and his character, the more you will trust that love. Even when you, it doesn't make sense and you don't see it. And I'm living proof in my own life, just in my own perspectives on desired dreams that I've waited and waited and waited on. And it's just, for me, it was a matter of perspective and just putting God into that equation and knowing that he does love me and he does desire good things for me. And maybe it is best that I've waited and he's done things in my life that I might not have had any other way. And so I see that and it does really encourage me. And I just hope that it really would encourage you too. And uh, I wonder, I don't know if anyone's a parent watching this, but if you're a parent, maybe you can relate because I'm sure parents feel the same way raising their children. You know, their children, they just want candy, they want to play video games, they want to, they don't want to do their homework, they want to run in the street, and so often as a parent, you have to kind of teach them and guide them and maybe make them do some things that they don't want to do or hold your hand as they cross the street for safety or make sure they get their homework done and, and eat vegetables, you <laughs> Even though nobody really enjoys vegetables, but you know, it's for their good because you love them and they may not see it in that moment, but maybe hindsight they will and they will appreciate how you love them. And I think that's how Jesus is, you know, he loves us and his love is just going to be something different. So let's jump back into the scripture in verse 17. I am the resurrection and the life. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he, he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I in the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me, yet he dies, shall, shall he live. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So Jewish culture is very interesting. When someone would die, they would hire and have all these mourners come and stay with you in the house, and it would be up to 30 days, and they would be very emotional, very dramatic, just bawling their eyes out, and they would be there to mourn with you, um, paying respects to the person who had passed away. And so this is a tradition that the family would normally stay in the home, or else they would go to the tomb and mourn there. They wouldn't go anywhere else because they would stay with these mourners. So here we see Martha getting up, going to meet Jesus, and Mary is waiting there. So back into our um, Bible verse is Jesus wept. It's uh, verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but when he was still in the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not had died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So this is interesting. <laughs> Very interesting to me. So Jesus is still hasn't even entered the town yet. And yet he's asking for Mary and she comes out and she's her response is just that she comes right away and all these Jews are watching her and they go with her thinking that she's going to the tomb and she meets Jesus falls at his feet says something very similar that Martha said if he had been here and it said that he was greatly troubled in his spirit and that he he wept and then the Jews interpret that, oh, see how much he loved him. Because I think that's just another version of our perspective of love. And we see that. And I think part of it is like, you know, Jesus is human. He's going to feel all of those emotions too, right? But he's also, he's not entering the scene. He didn't go to the home. He isn't participating with these mourners they he had Mary kind of bring them to him and so that's another one of my points I want to make is Mary responded quickly and the Jews noticed and followed and believed and so here they are and they they're following and says Jesus wept I feel like that could be in his humanity and it also could be that it took three times that his motives were questioned by people he loved and Jesus fully human and we experience deep emotions and his love um, and just the view of people's love were keeping them from seeing who Jesus really was when he says I am the resurrection and the life and he's meeting them where they are and hear their disappointment they wanted a recitation and he wants to do a resurrection in them and they don't know what's going to be coming next um, but then Jesus is saying in that moment I am the resurrection I am the life he's saying whatever you need whatever you're longing for in your life if you need something that's dead that needs to be resurrected and you want life and you want to live it abundantly you will find it in me not just what I can do for you but who I am my character you'll find it in my presence being in my presence just in my nature and who I am and I think I think that's partly why Jesus is is sad and crying I'm not totally sure either but I think he's upset because he really deeply cares about these people and he wants them to know on a really deep level who he is and what he can really do for them just by his character and his nature and he can do the same for you and for me and just think and Mary's responding quickly she's getting up these Jews are following who's watching you and who's watching how you handle whatever life throws your way and how you respond that they might follow you and they might believe I just want you to think about that God places us in the path of many people um, who he may want us to lead them to him and it's going to be 
our response that they're going to see and we could lead them to believe over faith in Jesus by how we respond, by how we react. And just what a beautiful response that Mary leads all these people to him. So back into our scripture, verse 38, Jesus raises Lazarus. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you were always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Then the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So another thing in Jewish tradition with the burials, on the third day, they believed that a resurrection might still be possible. They believed that the spirit could be hovering over the body. And they would actually go to the entrance of the tomb and they would say the person's name three times to see if they came out. So this is the fourth day. This is the next day. And here we find Jesus going up to the tomb, asking them to roll the stone away. And he says, Lazarus comes out. And he finally does because Jesus has that power. Jesus has the power of resurrection. And it's just so amazing that he's performing this miracle of resurrection in front of all these Jews and they're gonna believe it, believe it actually so many of them not all of them which kind of surprises me because man you know you think seeing something like that there'd be no way you couldn't believe there'd be no way but um that's another mystery for God <laughs> to figure out he knows he knows everybody and he knows who's gonna believe. Anyways, this is not the first time Jesus has resurrected someone. Other times he's done it, but this is the most public display. It is getting close to start putting into motion the the events that's going to take of Jesus' passion, the passion week that we see unfolding, because this is Jesus' timeline, this is his events, and he is in control, and, and it is his purpose to be going on the cross and, and Passover in another week, and this is just lining up the events for things to happen and happen in his time, and he is so incredible. And doing this would just be so public and so close to Jerusalem that it would really cause a stir. And that is what Jesus is also partly doing. There's just so much to him. It's really incredible. So the next story I want to take you to is in John 12. And it's Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. Six days before Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and he was having charge of the money bag, and he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, 
but you do not always have me. So Jesus comes to Bethany again, and it's such an amazing story. I just love that this is kind of the, the pinnacle story where we see these three characters. Um, and here, Lazarus is the living, walking <laughs> resurrection proof of Jesus's power, which was a powerful statement. The They were even plotting to kill Lazarus because you can't have this walking, living witness around to the power of Jesus's resurrection um, power, you'd have to kill him too. So people were plotting not only to kill Jesus, but also to kill him. And here he is, this living proof, just reclining at the table. And then it says that Martha served. It doesn't mention anything about her being anxious. So I take it as she was kind of delightfully serving. Maybe she had kind of learned to come to Jesus first and take upon his yoke and it's just beautiful and the three siblings are there Mary comes in with this really expensive ointment it says um, a pound of it and it would have been worth a year's wages and so I do kind of like that Judas made that statement because then we actually got to know the price of this lavish lavish gift and I'm not positive, but I really think it could have been uh, an inheritance gift and something that would have been used for her dowry and maybe that she wasn't married. And here, in an act of just celebration and worship and honor to Jesus, she anoints his feet with this oil and then she's wiping it up with her perfume. and. It's, I just try to imagine that scene. I mean, it's just such a lavish gift. And the aroma is just filling up the whole entire room. And a woman's hair is her glory. And she just let her hair come down, her glory come down. And she wipes his feet. She anoints him. It's another symbol of him being this Passover lamb, being the, the ultimate sacrifice When the Jews would pick a Passover lamb, they would bring it into their home and they would check it and inspect it and they would anoint its feet with oil. And that's exactly what we see going on here. It also mentions that Jesus was anointed two days before the Passover too. And that I think that one's actually on his head. And um, another time in scripture where he's anointed too by a sinful woman. Uh, But it's just, it's amazing, amazing thing. And it's this lavish gift, and it would have been about a year's wages, which would be maybe like $50,000 modern terms. So I like to take it in terms of this is her whole future in this jar. This is her future. This is what she's saved up for. This is what was given to her. And she just pours it out all over Jesus' feet, which is just beautiful. That brings me to my next point is Mary willingly took the opportunity to anoint Jesus with her costly inheritance in an act of worship. I don't know how many times it's laid on my heart to do something for God or give something to God and I'm I'm sad to admit I just don't always do it. When I do, I'm so blessed and I'm so thankful that I did. But sometimes you can mention it to another person or think about it too long or you just wait and you end up, if you're like me, talking yourself out of it and you don't end up doing it. And here she is. She doesn't waste this opportunity. She takes it. And the amazing thing with God is you know, he will never waste opportunity. Um, our God is such a giver. So this year, like personally, uh, my finances have really been stretched and it's kind of forced me to really take a look at where I'm spending my money and how I'm spending my money and just, just be more mindful. And yet at the same time, while studying these very scriptures and learning this for the retreat, 
I really felt God putting on my heart to tithe more and give more money to him. And I wasn't sure really exactly where the money was going to come from, but I knew I wanted to do it and take the opportunity to do it. And it's been such an interesting journey. God has provided just in the nick of time in ways I didn't expect and uh, or see coming. And when I sat down another time in this year and I wrote out all the money that I had tithed for this year, and then I wrote out all the money that came to me unexpectedly that I didn't plan for, I didn't know I was getting, and the amount that I got from God was over double what I had given him. And I just love that. And I've always heard stuff like that and stories like that. And it's the first time in my life that I really experienced it. And let me just encourage you um, in your your giving, whatever you may have, whether it's a lot or a little, uh, God just loves a happy giver. And you can't outgive God. He is a master at giving God so loved this world. He gave his only son and his love causes him to give. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And so I just really hope that encourages you. And also it's kind of neat. So here she's giving this very lavish gift. She's kind of doing it in celebration, but then he mentions that it's for his burial, which would have made this costly gift appropriate because it wouldn't have been considered appropriate in celebration. And it's just interesting. It doesn't say that Mary responds or say anything. So part of me wonders, like she spent so much time at Jesus's feet, so much time in that one-on-one presence, learning from him, gaining insight from him, And this brings me to another point with Mary is Mary knew things others didn't and her life became an aroma pleasing to the Lord. I just, you know, have you ever had quiet times where God just really reveals more of himself to you or his character or sometimes it's like you get little insights and and maybe others don't have that. But it's because you took that time and you, you spent that time with him. Your life and ministry will never have as much of an impact as your private prayer life. Your private, secret, quiet time with Jesus. If that is going to be powerful and impactful, then your public ministry will be birthed from that. And it will be powerful and impactful. And I just want to encourage you with that. So my final point is that God invites all of us to sit at his feet. And when we take time to do so, we gain insight, peace, and strength to handle life. And we walk away with the aroma of our Savior. I just love Mary Bethany. I love her story. I think there's just so much that we can gain from that you know if we did nothing else but work on our relationship with God I think it would just be so impactful and so beneficial Uh, and it's just a beautiful thing and having that discipline that drive to make a priority every day uh, and myself included it's just I just want to encourage you in that and I'll be praying for you and take care and I hope this um, session blessed you as much as it did bless me uh, learning about these ladies so I'll have one more final one and I'll present it to you hopefully in a week so take care and God bless and thank you for taking the time to watch these bye